recording started. Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Wednesday, May 11th, 2011, and we've got a hand already. Joyce, I'm wondering if you've got a problem right off the bat. Go ahead and put it in the chat. This is the Future of Education, and our special guest tonight is Hugh McGuire. Hugh, welcome, and thanks for coming. My pleasure to be here. So the Future of Education is now sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project. So that includes Classroom 2.0, the Global Education Conference, Library 2.0, Student 2.0, and Aula 2.0. Uh, many thanks also to Learn Central and to Wimbo Illuminate. Now Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, so I'm having a hard time not saying Illuminate. But we, I'm trying to make myself say Blackboard Collaborate from this point on. Coming up on June 25th, this is our all-day unconference, EduBloggerCon, now in its fifth year. This is a free event. It's at the Pennsylvania Visitors, uh, Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia, which is where ISTE is taking place. You don't need to be registered for ISTE to attend EduBloggerCon. We hope you'll come. We build the agenda at the beginning of the day. We think we have a really fun event that's going to take place in the evening after the, the regular day hours. I'm building an education declaration with Bernard Jane Porter doing a future search. Um, more information on that at edubloggercon.com. Also, of course, we'll have the Bloggers Cafe and It's the Unplugged. If you've never presented at a conference or you wanted to present and were turned down, go to It's the Unplugged. We have a presentation area. We'll be streaming those presentations out directly from the show. It's your chance to be famous. Um, and I didn't think I got approval today. I think I have approval for a t-shirt that will say Teacher 2.0 uh, that we're going to distribute at EduBloggerCon for free, so it should be a lot of fun. We've also announced the dates for our 2011 Global Education Conference. That's November 14th to 18th. Uh, as many of you know, that was uh, five days, 24 hours a day. Uh, we'll do the same this year. We had over 400 presentations last year from 62 countries. We're hoping for even more, so it should be a lot of fun. Mark your calendars, November 14 to 18, and that's globaledcon.com or the global education or globaleducationconference.com. Coming up on the future of education tomorrow, Paul Kimmelman talks about his book, The School Leadership Triangle. Uh, next week, Mark Fenske on the winner's brain, and Chris, I don't know how to say his last name, on his uh, fascinating book, The Art of Nonconformity. Uh, after that, Steve Denning and Sir Ken Robinson. Um, lots of fun coming up. Hopefully there's something there that is of interest to you. If you've missed the show, they are all recorded and up at futureofeducation.com, both in full Illuminate recordings and in MP3 forms. The two passion panels, passion-based learning panels that we held uh, 10 days ago and then one last night are up. Those recordings are up and uh, they're very fun. I hope you enjoy them. If this is your first time in Illuminate, it is participative. I would recommend right off the bat you go up to View Layouts and switch yourself to the Wide Layout. That gives you a little bit better view of the chat area. Uh, and I'm going to give you, a, you can, you're welcome to ask any questions in the chat if you have uh, an issue that comes up while we move along. But I'm going to go right to the map and give you permissions to indicate where you're participating from. Look for the wand with the red star to the left of the map. Click on that and click on the map. Feel free also to do a shout out in the chat, maybe the time and temperature, New Zealand, Canada, United States. A huge star, I'm going to guess that's Texas, but <laughs> wherever you're participating from, we sure appreciate it. If you're listening to the recording, thanks for taking the time. So Hugh, I'm an unabashed fan. LibriVox.org is one of my favorite projects in all of the internet. Uh, do you hear that from other people? Um, yeah, it pops up once in a while. It definitely has, um, uh, if you like um, audiobooks, it it's definitely generates a lot of passion, I guess, um, proved out mostly by the uh, or largely by the people who volunteer to do the work. There's obviously a great love among that group. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, uh, it's, it's something I'm very happy to have been involved in and, and very proud of. So you're not seeing, but we have this nice big picture of you up on the screen. Looks like a number of books behind you. You're relaxed. 
wearing glasses, just so you know. Right. Um, so I describe LibriVox as free crowdsourced recordings of books that are in the public domain. Does that description miss anything? Um, I, I think, well, I, I must say I have a little bit of a um, uh, dislike is maybe too strong, but I'm not crazy about the word crowdsource, but um, but that just about catches it. I think the, the volunteer um, was a good old-fashioned word that I think uh, really suits LibriVox well. So free volunteer read um, audiobooks of books in the public domain. Hey, good. I, um, I'm interested in that, and especially because I want to drill down a little bit on sort of what we're learning about participation on the web. Um, how many people are actively involved? Um, uh, let's see. There, there have been about 4,000 people over the course of the uh, project who have actually recorded books. Um, we have about 400 or 500 active projects at any given time. Um, there's about um, uh, about 30 or so people who are active sort of admin volunteer administrators of the project. Um, so I would guess that at any given time there's probably someone around uh, 500 people who are actively involved in, in the box. And then over the course of the whole project for five years, um, actually a relatively small number probably compared to some other big web projects, um, but something like uh, 30 or 40,000 people have signed up on our, uh, our, on our forum to participate but may not have actually uh, uh, participated by um, recording. And when I tried to look at the total number of books, I came to a page that gave me sort of search capabilities, and I would have guessed just under 4,000. Is that accurate? Uh, it's actually just over 4,000. I think it's close to 4,500 now, um, total catalog. Uh, works and we have some incredible uh, we, we, the, the our little stats page that is not um, easily accessible publicly um, generates the number of seconds that we've produced um, and, and calculates that as years so we're, we're coming up on three years worth of audio that we've recorded so if you started listening now um, you could listen 24 hours a day for three years and not uh, catch up to, to what we've produced. Obviously, that's terrific for a guy like me. Do you find that the statistics we hear about participation on the web are reflected in your sense of what's taking place at LibriVox? You know, we hear things like, you know, 3% will be really active, 10% will have some activity level, and 90% very low. Do you have any sense of how that breaks down for LibriVox? Uh, do you mean within people who are active or across listeners and, and volunteers? I guess within your volunteer community. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, definitely, I don't know. I don't know what the exact numbers would be, but um, there's a tiny handful of people who've produced. Uh, I think it's something like the top 20 producers have produced about 20% of the catalog, or something like that. So just an enormous amount of dedication from a small number of people. Um, and then there's the administrators who spend an awful lot of time, uh, who are often also uh, recorders as well. Um, but they spend an awful lot of time keeping everything running smoothly. Um, and then you have a lot of people who just come by, record, a, uh, um, record one chapter, and then they're gone, um, or do little bits here and there. So yeah, definitely we see a big um, a, a, a large amount of work gets done by a, a small number of very dedicated and passionate people. And I guess what, one other interesting related thing with LibriVox is we've seen a pretty high turnover rate ever since the beginning of the project among that core, especially the core admin group, that, that there's sort of a, a relatively frequent turnover over the course of uh, uh, a year or two years. People sort of um, dedicate a lot of time and they move on to other things. So we're always that that's one of the um, one of the things I, I guess I still worry about. Most of the day to day stuff works really well, but um, I just worry about making sure that the admin group has sort of fresh blood all the time and, and uh, that enthusiasm keeps up. You're so soft spoken. We're hearing in the chat that it's a little bit hard to hear you for some. If okay. you're having a hard time hearing Hugh, you can always raise your audio slider. 
uh, that's down at the bottom of the part below the participant window. And I've tried to increase the volume on the teleconference as well, and hopefully that will be okay. And I will speak more loudly and more clearly. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing fine. Um, so. Um, it you know, 2000 and was it 2000 is five years that you've been yeah, doing the yeah. Vipox. August 2005, yeah. So it's coming up six, I guess. Yeah. That seems like a pretty short period of time. I guess it's. If, I feel like it's really hard for me to gauge time on these projects. Um, how much time does it take you to run LibreVox now? Is it an hour a day? Half an hour a day? Uh, it's it's gotten actually that that I'm uh, I would say yeah over the course of a week it's um, it'd be maybe a half hour a day so I'm I'm really I don't do anything on the day to day operations of or very little on the day to day operations of LibriVox so again there's a a big um, group of uh, volunteer administrators who just kind of keep everything running um, and I guess I I sort of I have a couple of special projects that. Um, I'm involved in, so I'm I'm helping uh, shape. We're doing a big redesign of the website, um, and then I do a couple of other little things here and there of uh, of that kind. But but for day to day stuff, um, uh, I don't really have um, uh, too many responsibilities left anymore, um, which which suits me well because I'm not very good at running things day to day in in something like Liverbox. There are a lot of people who are much better at that than I am. So we're seeing shout outs in the chat for Treasure Island, great voice and accent. Uh, yeah. Maria says her daughter's philosophy class listened to the Greeks on there. Okay. Um, I've listened to several Jane Austen books mm -hmm. <laughs> as a, because that's a, she's a favorite author of our family. Do you um, have any way of translating your work here beyond just sort of civic virtue? Is, has it, Opened any doors for you? You know any ways in which your career has benefited from your volunteer involvement? Oh, absolutely. I think um, LibriVox was sort of my. I, I started it so in 2005. I'd been thinking about the web and open source and different um, kinds of things that could happen on on the web. Um, and LibriVox was, in some sense, a conscious experiment about about trying to apply open source ideals to a non software project and I guess the big inspiration was Wikipedia. Um, so uh, but but Wiki, uh, excuse me, but but LibriVox really being uh, the success that it has been um, has sort of shaped um, shaped my life I guess uh, as as I went more into doing Stuff on the web, and so I, I, um, I guess you would call me a startup entrepreneur now. And, and LibriVox is kind of the thing that opened, um, opened, I guess, doors and, and sort of led me into that, into that path. Um, so really, everything I do uh, now on the web, um, uh, both what I learned in LibriVox, but also what it brought me in terms of, um, uh, I guess. Uh, you know, it's it's a project that's known um, not by everyone, of course, but but people who do know it, um, uh, and and when people take a look at it, uh, even if they don't know it, it is it is a fairly impressive thing. So I think that um, that yeah, it's been uh, absolutely helpful for for the rest of, you know my non-volunteer life as well as volunteer life. Yeah. I think I listened to an interview in which you were discussing that you were starting with the Secret Agent by Conrad. Was that, am I correct on that? Yes, that was the first book we did, yeah. And and then, uh, uh, you know, what were the, sort of those first, the, you have the idea, you get started. What were the the changes or, or moments where things went differently than you had expected? Or did everything kind of go the way you thought it would? N no, in, in fact, it didn't. It, it's funny, I had just the kernel of the idea really was, open source audiobook production. I didn't have any idea um, of anything, really. Um, and so I guess the first, when when it started, it was on a, uh, it was just a blog, and, and I said, I'm doing this book, post a comment here if you would like to record a chapter, and then people sent these things in, and then I 
had to figure out how to get them onto the uh, on the web somewhere, and uh, eventually those uh, or fairly soon those they went onto Internet Archive. But really, very quickly, uh, everything got out of control because I was trying to manage. Um, I guess we had about ten projects, and the first big thing that happened was I. Um, there, uh, one of the volunteers who was very keenly involved I sort of said, do you want to manage kind of uploading and cataloging these things? And I said, yes, I would love to do that. And um, So that was the first big thing, was the first kind of major delegation. And then the second, um, uh, I guess it was a big change. Also, I didn't, I didn't really have any skills of web design, so we, uh, some of the volunteers pitched in to help design the web. And then the big change, I guess, was when I decided that I wasn't going to choose the books anymore. I would just let people um, choose books themselves and, and do books they wanted to do. Um, and then really it evolved in this really interesting organic way um, where I guess I, I sort of insisted um, on some very core principles at the beginning, um, but other than that sort of allowed um, I guess sort of forced my ego to step down and let other people who thought they had solutions to problems we had um, run with the solutions that they had. And so um, it, it very much evolved in ways that, that went beyond my uh, expectations um, really very early on. What were those core beliefs that you had? Um, well, the first one was that we would be uh, releasing our stuff um, with a public domain license rather than a Creative Commons license. And so uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with uh, the different the world of copyright and different kinds of licenses, but um, there was a big movement that was very inspiring called Creative Commons, which allowed people to license um, artistic work they were doing and allow certain rights to users, so to copy it or um, share it or give it away for free as long as certain things were um, respected that a attribution was given, um, uh, perhaps for non-commercial uses, you could do whatever you want. And I was really insistent that we were taking these works from public domain where there is no restriction um, to begin with and that we would give them away with the same um, principle, no restrictions at all. Um, and so that that engendered a fair amount of controversy and still does. People, Some people don't like that idea and think that it should be for non-commercial use or, or other kinds of things like that. Um, so that was one. And then I guess the other big one that, that gets lots of um, complaint skill and, and uh, questioning is, is that we will accept anyone to, to read as long as they read the text the way it's written and as long as the um, their reading is comprehensible and that the tech, uh, tech specs are okay on, on the recording, we allow those people to record. And so the, it's a very counterintuitive thing that you would let just anyone, no matter how you know, bad their reading style or whether they stutter or have an accent or whatever, to, to do recordings. Um, but that we've sort of stuck by that principle. And I think um, the results speak for themselves. And what the results are are a huge catalog of free audiobooks, some of which are um, with questionable recording skills, and most of which are done with very good recording skills, and some of which are professional quality. And, and I think that our insistence on that very, um, I guess, egalitarian view of what we were doing um, was uh, and continues to be, I guess, a, a strange core principle that, that is controversial in some ways, but I think is very much um, underlies, uh, I think, some of the wonderfulness of, of, uh, of LibriVox. So I want to make a connection here, and I'm intrigued by this. So when we did the Global Education Conference last November, we had sort of a similar policy. We didn't really vet the presentations. By having a virtual conference rather than a physical conference, we didn't have the room or time constraints. So we basically said, we want everybody to be included. This is an inclusive conference. So if you want to present, you can present. And a couple of things happened, one of which was the quality level was much higher than I expected, kind of when we opened the doors that way. And the second was it sort of followed this internet principle of letting the audience choose. Mm -hmm. So if they weren't happy, they could kind of move on. And I hear a really significant parallel with what you've done. 
that you don't have the, the cost constraints you normally would for publishing. So let's not create any barriers for people to get involved. Let's make it inclusive. And the audience can choose if they like it or don't. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, I, I guess you're, there were a couple of reasons behind that idea. Part of it was that I'm not very good at recording audiobooks, and so I thought, well, if I'm starting a project, I better make one that I would be allowed to participate in because otherwise um, it doesn't make any sense. But then, you know, we had this really radical and, and um, sort of ridiculous objective to record every public domain book in the universe and make it available for free on the Internet. And if that's your objective, well, you need all the help you can get. Um, and so, uh, you know, to limit people because they don't sound like uh, they've trained at, at, at NPR or whatever didn't make any sense to me. And then when it gets down to a judgment, I mean, what, what's what's the, the point of that? And um, uh, although, I, I mean, I can see why people um, make judgments in certain cases, but but beyond that, I mean, our time frame is the next million years. So, um, you know, if there's a really crappy recording of The Secret Agent by Joseph Conrad, the hope is that in five years someone will get so annoyed by that that they'll make a, a good recording and give it to us. So, so the the um, yeah, the, I think the parallels are are definitely there. And and um, what's really interesting about having the no um, uh, no quality control kind of approach is that the result has been lots of amazing stuff that I, I don't think we would have gotten if, if we had had strict quality controls at the beginning because I think it would have been just less um, less fun for people. So. I, I, I think that we'll, I want to talk a little bit later about sort of core principles of these kinds of projects, but I think one of the course for me is kind of the tenor or the character of the community. And part of what you did early on was to was to make it highly inclusive. And my guess is that that's a, a pretty significant decision. I, um, my wife and I both listened to Persuasion by Jane Austen, and at the same time, and she chose a version which was read by the same person in very uh, clear, crisp recordings, uh, someone highly articulate. And I chose the version that had a variety of people, for everyone from from a raspy smoker in Texas to uh, someone in China. Mm -hmm. And I loved the diversity and variety, but she couldn't stand it. Mm -hmm. And I would have enjoyed the other one, but I actually had, I liked hearing people read. And I thought, well, when we read together, when we read to our children, or we read you know, in some other f forum where you read aloud, which doesn't happen that often, but it's something I enjoy. You know, I like hearing regular people reading, so I, that was okay for me. Yeah, I think that also was another big. I mean, it's, it's funny. There, there are these core ideas, and then these other things that I guess come out of my, you know, my personal taste. You know, I think that um, it's fair to say that certainly at the beginning of LibriVox, my um, sort of just personal foibles were. Um, probably pretty influential in how the project evolved, and so you know one of those one of the things is that I love the way people talk. I love accents. I love people who um, have interesting intonation or whatever. And so the idea that you know people would often come and say, "Well, I'd like to volunteer for LibriVox, but I have this big you know Alabama accent or something," they say, "Well, of course, come along. You know, read read whatever it is." And and to me that the the amazing thing about LibriVox when you compare it to um, professional audiobook recordings is that it's, in a lot of cases, it's just someone reading to you because they love that book and they want to share that with someone. And there's a very different sort of feel to that than someone who is performing a book professionally and it creates a distance. And so, of course, not everyone likes that sort of sense of, raw intimacy that you get, but, but there's something very interesting to me anyway about, about that quality that you get from the um, from uh, certain LibriVox recordings where, where that sort of humanity comes, comes through and, and there's a real sense that at the other end of the microphone there's someone living their life in their apartment in, in Brooklyn or San Diego, wherever it is, and, and they're just reading to you because um, they love the book, and, and that to me is, uh, has been, again, part of the magic sauce that makes LibriVox uh, so wonderful. 
we're getting some fun comments, uh, especially from Maria Druchkova, who says that she's shy about her accent, but maybe she should do this, and we're cheering her on. Um, actually, that's an interesting piece you just brought up, because I, after I listened to the book, I actually kind of wanted to get to know the readers. Is there any ability, is there any, I, I didn't check for this on the website, but is there any kind of profiling or ability to get in contact with the reader? So, um, so th th we have a couple of mechanisms now. There's actually an email address that you can send to say thank you to so-and-so um, for their reading in, in a certain book, and I think, gosh, I, I forget what it is, but if you look on the website, there's an email address there. I think it's thank you .librivox and at I think it's Yahoo or something funny like that. Um, but uh, so that will get to the person, and normally um, that gets posted publicly on the forum, and the person gets a, a, a PM on our forum software to let them know. And so they usually can um, uh, contact you back if, if they wish to do that. Um, and then the other, the, the best mechanism really for anyone who's, I mean, even if you're just a fan of, of LibriVox stuff, really the best means of communication is to join the forum and, and post a message or, or just say hello. And I really loved, um, you know, Andy Mitchell's recording of whatever it was. And, um, uh, you know, someone will um, come by and Andy will probably hear about it and, and will come by and thank you for saying thank you. And, and so, you know, we're a very open and, and welcoming community. And I think um, you were talking about core principles and sort of the, the sorts of things that um, helped with the success of, of LibriVox. And that was the other thing is that I kind of insisted from the beginning that we weren't going to be a, have an internet forum that was um, filled with loud fights and various flame wars and whatnot. And, and so we're, uh, we're sort of disturbingly civil on, on, the, uh, on the LibriVox forum. And, and I guess that's, um, we have our, one of our um, forum policies is be nice. And if, if you're not nice, then you get reprimanded and and shown the door uh, if if you keep violating that, and that's happened only once, as far as I can recall, in five years. So, so Maria, uh, no, I'm sorry, Mark in the chat mentioned how quickly he was able on his pull up uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense and listen to it while he was driving. Uh, it feels to me as though smartphones have really changed my ability to listen to books. That, I, that before I had to kind of monkey with USB sticks and get files and move them around. And you identify in the interview I listened to podcasting as a big shift. Have you seen any kind of actual uh, change that you would attribute to smartphones? Oh, yeah. So um, um, in, let's see, I can't quite remember the dates exactly, but relatively early in the life of the iPhone, um, Someone contacted me and said, "Hey, I'm building a, a app um, to um, an app to to, for, to play audiobooks, and we'd like to use your catalog." And it turns out we had built a um, a relatively clunky system, but the ability for developers to pull our whole catalog down and and uh, use use it. Um, and so there've been a couple of uh, iPhone apps which are usually in the top um, the top five. Sometimes they bump down to the top ten, but um, of, of iPhone book apps uh, that, that pull from our catalog. So they've had both those the apps that I'm thinking of have had, um, I think, well over a million downloads each. Um, so I think that there's uh, a lot of people accessing um, our stuff through smartphones. And, and, you know, really the principle behind LibriVox is we make the stuff um, and we try to make it as available as we can and hopefully other people will find smart ways to, to get the books to, to people. So, um, so definitely seen a, a big shift there and I totally agree with you. The, uh, the complication of getting um, a podcast into your car five years ago compared to now um, it, it, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. Because I, I remember you know, burning CDs and all sorts of unpleasant kinds of things to, uh, to uh, play audiobooks from LibriVox in, in the car, and, and uh, it's a lot easier now. So I'm on my Android phone, and I'm not finding anything named LibriVox. Uh, if you look for audiobooks, um, there, there are a couple of, you should find a couple of apps there. 
Interesting. That will be something to play with. So we have some good questions from the chat. Uh, Dee Walker wants to know how much of the catalog is nonfiction. Oh, um, I'm going to just give a wild guess that is probably wrong, but I would say 25 or 30 percent is nonfiction. And Doug wants to know, have you ever thought of a star rating system for the recordings? Right. So this is, again, part of our crazy radical um, ideas, um, one of which is that we don't, um, we in fact, don't allow negative criticism on our, on our forum um, unless someone asks for it. And we decided that our website wouldn't have any ratings, and that um, and the reason behind that is that, again, going back to this idea that we needed volunteers to to um, to enjoy doing this and dedicate themselves, and it's amazing how quickly a volunteer audiobook um, re reader will stop reading audiobooks if they get the hint of a negative comment. So uh, we won't have ratings on our site, but again, because our catalog is open and accessible to other developers, I think that we're, we have started to see different web apps coming up, different um, uh, uh, mobile phone apps coming up where they are starting to rate LibriVox stuff. So, so again, our, our policy has always been that our job is to produce the stuff, and what other people do with it is, um, is, is is, is sort of up, up, up to them, and hopefully people will find smart ways to sort through the, uh, the LibriVox catalog over the, over the coming years. Dee Walker asks, what's the longest book in hours that's been recorded? Um, well, uh, we have Ulysses, which is a very checkered recording. Uh, so James Joyce's Ulysses, which is 28, well, I guess it's 25 hours or something like that. Um, and I'm not sure how far we are in the process, but we're doing War and Peace. And that, um, uh, I don't think we've completed the whole thing, but, uh, but it sort of carries on. So that's, I, I don't even know how many hours, hours that is. But anyway, we, we certainly have um, some 20 and 30 and probably more our, our recordings. Some great questions coming up. Have you ever thought about making books, Greg wants to know, that have the text and the audio combined? So the text would be highlighted as the person reads. Yeah, so once again, um, our job is to make the audio. Um, there's text out there, so uh, generally we get our text from Project Gutenberg, which is another great old granddaddy of free web projects. Um, so they make uh, free digital text available and have been doing since 1970, if you can believe it. Um, and I've talked over the years to different developers about uh, building something like that. There are some technologies out there, but we haven't found the solution to match those te texts to audio, and I, I would really dearly love to do that. I've talked to the Internet Archive, who's another sort of partner of ours. They actually host all our audio, and we've talked to them about um, um, you know, starting an a open source project to build a tool to allow people to link the audio to the text. Um, uh, and then, you know, once you've got that, then, then it would be relatively easy to build different apps on, on top of it. So uh, very interested, would love to see that done, and I think, I think it would be a great um, tool for language learners and, well, just really a great tool for lots of different reasons, um, but, but it's not really within the capacity of LibriVox itself to, to do anything like that. Are there uh, LibriVox books in languages other than English? Yes, we have uh, 29 languages um, represented in the catalog. Um, biggest ones would be the sort of European languages, so German, French, Spanish, Italian, I think are the, the biggest after English. But then we have uh, Finnish, we have uh, Chinese, we have Japanese, we have um, uh, Portuguese, certainly. Um, so there are 29 languages, although you know the, the there's probably 10 that have any any substantial number of, of works, and then the rest uh, peter out pretty quickly. 
it would just be one or two works for the other languages. Larry wants to know if you have ever done book summaries. Uh, in audio? I'm guessing. Um, so each book has a little description written in text on, on our catalog pages. Um, but uh, but no, we don't. Uh, we, we do only unabridged versions or whatever the text is that, that we get from Project Gutenberg. Um, Greg wanted to know if you've ever had anybody read in a crazy voice on purpose. <laughs> there was. We have had at least one that I can think of. One fellow who um, uh, sort of sang through his uh, his readings and, and did various other kinds of uh, uh, fairly substantial number of, of quite crazy things. So yeah, there are a few, uh, there's certainly a few oddballs that, that uh, turn up in the Gruelox occasionally. Uh, there are questions about uh, drama or plays that would have multiple voices. Um, what do you call that and how does that actually work? Yeah, so that was, th there were a few moments, well, wait a second, maybe this LibriVox thing is going to be a big success. And the first point where that happened was when we first opened up the ability to um, suggest books or, or to start to record books. And one person, and this would have been in the first three months of LibriVox's existence, or it was, I think it was when I first opened it up, so probably would have been two months in, and someone said he wanted to do the histories by Thucydides, and I thought, God, if someone's reading, you know, old um, Greek history texts, then you know we've 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 sort of touched a nerve of of the kind of thing where people start to do really interesting stuff, and the second. A uh, thing like that was when someone decided they wanted to organize recording, and I think it was Importance of Being Earnest was the first play we did. And what happened was uh, there were whatever 15 or 20 people who all recorded their parts, and then someone else sat down and just edited all those parts together into a, into one one piece. Um, so I thought, yeah, just the, the amount of work that went into to editing that all together was just astounding to me. And I thought, okay, we've, we've got something here. So yes, we have dramatic works, um, a fairly good number. We produced King Lear in a, in a week. Um, so it's, it's a fairly popular sort of thing for uh, LibriVoxers to, uh, to do. So we have a, a fairly decent collection of, of dramatic works. Has anybody done a conference call where where that was done actually synchronously? Not that I know of, no. Would there be reasons not to do that? But that doesn't mean it hasn't happened, nor does it mean it <laughs> won't happen. Um, I don't know of it, but uh, it's certainly possible. I mean, again, to us, we have we have a fairly um, loose interpretation of what's allowed and what's not, and, and really it's as long as the audio conforms to the text, then, then you're good to go. So, um, so yeah, that we, there has been talk of doing live things. We've done a couple of live recordings, so I mentioned Ulysses, and, and that's one that uh, if you wish to listen to an audio book, I wouldn't really suggest listening to our version of Ulysses, but that, that had um, we encouraged people to do it live in groups, um, in public places, and things like that. So, and, and there was no editing uh, required for that. So it ends up being quite a, a mess of the project that one, but but quite charming. <laughs> Who's? Uh, do you have any sense of your youngest reader? Uh, yes, we had a four-year-old. Um, and we frequently have uh, sort of 10, 11 year olds who, who do stuff. Um, so, so we go from, as far as I know, we've gone from 4 to 91 is our age range. And each school's done this as a project? Yes, um, schools have done it with a project, um, but it's not something that engenders a whole lot of enthusiasm when a school announces they're going to do it as a project, not because we don't think it's a wonderful thing to do, but um, generally what happens, what, or what has occasionally happened is that, is that a, a, a teacher has a great idea which is doing a LibriVox project and, and the classroom is sort of let loose on our forums and, and um, 
uh, the, the sort of herding of that um, online group is is left to a, a very um, frustrated um, uh, <laughs> box volunteer who says, but we told them to do this and they didn't do it. So anyway, the, the uh, as long as a teacher is willing to work closely with our um, other volunteers to make sure that what's um, sort of uh, submitted by the kids uh, or students um, conforms to our, our needs, then then all is well. But but that's that's really the requirement. So and isn't always the case. So I want to move on to your other projects. And Marie yeah. asks a question that I think sort of brings us there. And she asks, do you accept modern authors from the public domain? Um, so I guess that that's uh, suggesting um, talking about my other uh, a, a new a much newer project which we launched in late October and the idea was to take some of the um, production ideas behind LibriVox but apply the process to um, uh, to commercial publishers and existing authors with copyrighted work. Um, so that's called iambic uh, audiobooks, i a m b i k uh, dot com, and so that's kind of where uh, where we do uh, where we're working with a lot of um, publishers and, and producing uh, newer works. Um, and then in LibriVox itself, the answer is is almost always no to that. Um, Generally, uh, so our rules for books that can go into LibriVox are it must be published and in the public domain. And uh, generally, if it's been published uh, and a publisher has anything to do with the copyright, then it's not going to be um, uh, put into the public domain. And uh, there, are, there is another project um, called Podio Books, which is um, probably better suited for those kinds of, of works. So I'm thinking, uh, and I think Maria was thinking of Cory Doctorow. Uh -huh. And so he releases in Creative Commons. Yeah. So that's not public domain, so you couldn't do it, right? Yeah, that's right. So th that's another, um, uh, I guess, point of, I don't know if it's contention exactly, but, um, uh, you know, there was questions in the early days about why we wouldn't allow uh, Creative Commons books as well, and the answer ended up just being that 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 we, there are enough public domain books to do, um, and that's what our focus is, and that's just going to be what our sort of cutoff is for our catalog. Um, so we don't do Cory Doctorow, um, but lots of other people do. So there's you know, um, to the extent that people want to want to do that, um, you know, there's no need for LibriVox necessarily to be involved. So is that the kind of thing that iambic would? Accept? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, we would um, definitely accept a, a Creative Commons book at iambic. Um, but uh, on iambic, you know, we're doing things slightly differently. Where um, we actually are vetting the the people who are uh, producing the audiobooks. So we're um, uh, doing sort of much more, I guess, um, uh, uh, making sure that the the sound quality is is much more professional and the production is much more professional and we're also selecting the books based on um, I guess various uh, taste or interest or whatever and, and the publishers are coming from. So. Well I thought of several books that aren't in the public domain but are out of print where I imagine that if I contacted the author I might be able to get permission mm -hmm. to do a, an audio version of the book that would probably never come out otherwise. Yeah. Has anybody done that? Yeah, um, so that's kind of part of what Iambic does. Um, we've done a number of books that are out of print where the author has gotten the, uh, the author owns the copyright and the, and the, um, uh, the audio rights on the book as well. So, uh, so yeah, I think, um, you know, if, if the book looks interesting, that's definitely the kind of stuff that we do at, at Iambic for sure. And can the reader participate in the revenue? Yes, yeah, that's that's how iambic works. So we um, we revenue share between the right hold, rights holder of the text, um, the narrator, and then iambic takes a cut for organizing it all. So with the sort of amazing self-publishing movement right now, that just every time I turn around seems to be 
uh, this looming tsunami, um, do you think that there will be kind of an echo in the audiobooks? Will people who self-publish then begin to read their books, and are you hoping to capture them? Um, yes, I think there will be an echo. Um, the problem, you know, the, the, the problem with publishing at all in, in, in the universe now is that there's just so much stuff getting published, um, which on the one hand is absolutely fantastic and wonderful, and um, but, but it makes the uh, commercial side of what book publishing used to be a very different affair now, and I don't think we've, you know, I don't think we've seen the full impact of, of what's happening in the book publishing industry yet, and it's, it's going to be just another, uh, I expect just another couple of years before um, um, cataclysms start happening in book publishing, uh, sort of the big book publishing houses, um, and um, so, you know, I think everything's going to change uh, in the next five years or so in book publishing, and there's going to be an awful lot of stuff published, and the challenge then becomes how do you connect um, the stuff that people are writing or the audio that they're making with the people who want to listen to it, and that, that's it's sort of an uncertain thing, and, and you know, we, we're seeing even with, with Iambic, you know, I had this great success of LibriVox, and, and we're recognizing that as soon as you put a a price tag on an obscure author, um, it, it it just doesn't kind of excite people the way free Jane Austen does. So, um, you know, so fi figuring out how book publishing works in the next five years is going to be difficult for, for everyone. <laughs> Um, with the experience that I've had, for instance, at, at LibriVox, you know, I haven't figured out how to crack it yet. So, um, and I think that was a very rambly answer to your question. Um, no, but but it takes us right to where I wanted to go. So, uh, sort of the future of publishing. I've discovered that I did not expect this, but I love reading books on my phone. Mm -hmm. This came out of the blue for me. So I downloaded the Kindle app and. Uh, my kids were reading The Hunger Games, and I, on a whim, just you know, bought the first volume and read it on my phone and absolutely loved reading on my phone. Now, I've discovered that that only works for me for fiction. Mm -hmm. When I read a regular book, I write all over the book, and I'm so frustrated reading a book where I want to be writing about it in the margins, mm -hmm. and I can't. Um, and that then has led me to sort of thoughts about how do we share those notations? And I'm sure we're going to see forms of books that have shared notations. But then that leads me to worrying about scope, meaning a lot of times, you know, I don't get involved in conversations because the conversation's too large. Mm. So if I wanted to share my book notes, I, you know, I've looked at the at the the, the little bit that Kindle does to actually show what other people have highlighted in the books. And that really doesn't mean anything to me because it's too big a community. Yeah. So how, do you have any sense of how this might sort out or kind of clues that you've seen to w sort of where you think we might be headed in a lot of these areas? Yeah. Um, so firstly, I had a very similar experience. Even uh, I had started a company that, that was – Looking at, at sort of replicating in book publishing what LibriVox did in audio, so so a digital book publishing um, company called Book Oven, and um, and so I was already sort of committed to this idea of eBooks, but I actually hadn't read an eBook from start to finish, and it seemed unlikely to me that I would actually want to do so, and and I had an iPod Touch. This is going back, uh, I guess this is 2009, which isn't that long ago, um, uh, end of 2009, and I, I got an iPod Touch. I bought one secondhand from a friend of mine, and I downloaded an uh, e-reading app called Stanza, um, put a bunch of books on it, and uh, basically the next day I started reading War and Peace, and I kept at it until I finished it, and I thought this is such a pleasurable reading experience. So I've had the same, I had the same sort of thing where I didn't really expect to like uh, reading on my phone, but but indeed I, I did. Um, and I share your frustration also with reading a book where you want to be taking notes or underlining passages or whatever and being unable to do it um, with the technology that we have now. 
Um, and so, uh, but but the wider question, I think certainly we're going to go towards much more annotation um, of books, but there's got to be this question of filtering out, um, you know, whose annotations do you want to see and whose don't you want to see. You know, you, you might want to see Solomon Rushdie's annotations, but you don't want to see, you know, Bob Smith, your neighbor, um, and you might want to see your daughters or, or your college professors or whatever. So I think there's going to be um, sort of a process of, of filtering, filtering this stuff out. Um, and I, I just saw I, I've, I've got I have a young daughter, and so we take lots of photos of her. And there's a um, iPhone app called Pass. I don't know if you've seen that before, but it's some ex Facebook people. And the idea is it's a photo sharing app. Um, so you take a photo and you share what's called a moment, but What's interesting about it is that it's, a, it's among a very small group of people, so I don't know what the maximum is, but it's generally sort of 10 people or so that, that you're sharing with. And I suspect that around books you're going to see something similar where, where there are sort of uh, these ways to have just small communities around, around a book, that, communities that are actually valuable to you. And I think, in fact, those could be very interesting to, to discover people that way. So it seems like we have two hurdles there. One is a way to take notes that is intuitive or comfortable or is natural, maybe not equivalent, but as natural to us as taking a physical note in a book. Mm -hmm. And then the second is some mechanism for how you share that and with whom. Yeah. Which is intriguing. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a comfortable note-taking system on an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, just because, for me anyway, I don't find them pleasant to, to write anything substantial uh, on as they are, let alone you know detailed notes about what I think this author is getting at or whatever. Um, but at the same time, I think that we're going to get eventually to the point where when you're reading a book uh, on your phone, that's going to be um, synced to a um, a, a version of that book that's on the web that you can go to afterwards, and so you might put just a little star in various places, and then be able to go actually do some work on it on on the web. So that's that's what I expect to happen there. I think Jim in the chat maybe has it right here, <laughs> at least for me, which is some ability to record and and have that transcribed. And I know my Android phone actually does a really good job with voice recognition. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I could actually click on the word, leave the voice note, and have it transcribe it, I actually, Jim, I think you, you at least for me, you're getting me closer. Yeah, that's that's a, a really. Um, uh, what, that's also, you know, that that's it's funny. That's we see this often where our first instinct is often to replicate exactly what the technology was on paper, but make it digital. Um, and, and then you realize, well, but wait a second, we could also do X, Y, or Z, and that's a perfect use of, of what these smartphones can do. I mean, they're amazing devices. I think that would be great. I'm in favor. I'll so Becky buy. says, yeah, me too. <laughs> I just don't want to be inventing. Um, so I, I'm interested in sort of maybe some of the lessons that you've learned about collaborative uh, or volunteer projects that might be more universal. And one that I've discovered lately for me is that uh, I've been reading this book called The Diffusion of Innovations. Mm -hmm. And it, um, I've been sort of skipping in and out of it. And in one part, there's a description of how, for for a long time, corporations have known that um, a good 60 to 70 percent of the innovations of their products did not actually come from the inside, but came from lead users. Mm -hmm. That uh, for a physical product, say a customer actually would go back to the company and say, oh, "You know, I'd love this," but it wasn't very visible. And it seems now that you know, one of the things I'm certainly seeing is that when you're coordinating a volunteer or a community project, that there really is a shift in terms of who comes up with the ideas and 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 where a project goes based on those that that passionate core group. I'm sensing that that's a part of your model as well. Is it? And are there other sort of big kind of lessons you feel you've learned about running community projects? Um, yeah, I guess 
I guess in a way, another sort of radical approach that we had at Libavox was that our, the people we were serving, um, the people for whom Librivox existed, um, are the volunteers who make the audio recordings. And so we were this crazy kind of publisher who essentially said, well, the listeners don't, don't really matter all that much. It's really about the volunteers. Um, um, so, so I guess that's one thing that that in this world of collaboration, that 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 institutions need to be um, catering. You know, if you want collaboration to happen, then you have to set it up so that the the primary goal is to to, to make happy the people who are collaborating on on whatever it is you're doing. Um, and I guess the the other, probably the most important thing, and I think this is true of just about everything in the universe, but um, but it's particularly true on the web and and um, uh, and collaborative projects is that you just have to be absolutely clear about um, what it is that you're doing. Um, so what's what's sort of the big idea, or at least the clear idea that will help them decide: Do I wish to collaborate or join this project or not? And once they make that decision, it's going to be very easy and clear for them to know how it is that they get in, involved. Um, and so, you know, it goes back to, to very simple things of communicating clearly um, and, and sort of making um, making very simple uh, statements about how you exist in the universe. And, and my favorite example of that is Wikipedia, where for the longest time their, their um, tagline was the encyclopedia anyone can edit. And it just says everything you need to know about about Wikipedia, and you can make your decision about the politics and the ideals and all that. Um, at, uh, you know, you can make those decisions, but the main thing is that it's something you can edit, and and you know know it from that statement, um, and everything follows from that. Um, and so with LibriVox, you know, we tried to be very clear that our objective is to make all um, audiobooks. Uh, record all audiobooks and give them away for free, all public domain audiobooks, and that that's, that you know has been the, the core of the mission. I think inspired enough people to join on, and we worked very hard to try to make it clear once they decided yes to ha how they would go about doing that. Did you have any ideas that you thought were brilliant that just didn't take hold? Uh, one was was LibriVox in the classroom. Um, I thought that I thought we would have tons of schools involved. Um, there are any number of of ideas that were sort of thought of um, in LibriVox in the early days, where we thought, oh, we'd go in this direction or that direction, and and it's really interesting when you're running a volunteer collaborative project. Um, it's very easy to know what's successful or what's a good idea or what isn't because someone says, okay, yeah, I'll help with that, or they don't. And if they don't, then the, the idea just kind of peters out. So we had um, a good number of those kinds of ideas uh, over the years. Intriguing uh, how the audience begins to really define the direction of projects. And I'll often point to Flickr or Twitter sort of as these canaries in the coal mine because there are Web 2.0 uh, internet projects, but there are also the tools that we use to be involved in the internet. Mm -hmm. And they seem to be so dramatically influenced by the user's demands that it feels as though that's a model that's going to move from areas like LibriVox and these volunteer projects to much more mainstream understandings of how you get things done. Yeah, that's definitely something I'm I'm very interested in, and I must say I'm I'm in a way compared to how optimistic and idealistic I was in 2005 when LibriVox started, and all of a sudden it, it was working really well, and I thought, oh gee, you know, it's it's going to be uh, the world is going to fill up with these kinds of collaborative sorts of projects. Um, doing interesting stuff, and uh, I guess it hasn't occurred um, in the mainstream as nearly as much as I, I would have thought, um, but clearly the web enables so much more efficient use of people's interest and collaboration and stuff that, that certainly we're, we're surely going to see more and more of this. Hugh, it's really been delightful to have you on. We've reached the top of the hour. I'm virtually clapping for you. 
you can't see it, <laughs> but you. so is the so are members of the audience here. We have a little clapping hand symbol, and you're getting lots of clapping. Okay. Uh, really appreciate your coming on the show uh, and taking the time. Again, love what you have done, and really appreciate the time and energy and effort you've put into creating a service that um, has made such a difference for so many people. Uh, don't forget tomorrow night, Paul Kimmelman on the School Leadership Triangle, and then next week, The Winner's Brain and the Art of Nonconformity. Thanks, you. So, so appreciate it. Okay. Thanks a lot, Steve. Take care and good night. Bye. Thanks, everyone, for coming. That was a lot of fun. What a, what a terrific project. Um, I do need to actually close the room down so the recording can process. I uh, hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And we'll turn off the recording now.